the weekly show with David J. Maloney. This week, we look back at our favorite moments from the weekly show. And now, here's your host, David J. Maloney. Welcome, everyone, to the weekly show. I'm your host, David J. Maloney. This week, we take a look back at a few highlights from interviews we enjoyed over the past year or two. New stories, new insights, and for some of us, new faces were introduced to us. Sit back and enjoy some of the great guests and stories from past seasons of the weekly show with David J. Maloney, coming up after the break. The 83 on that tour was in Nuremberg, Germany, in the place where Hitler made all his speeches, in the actual field, Zeppelin field. So if you're if you're Jewish, being in Germany in general is not the most comforting feeling. I mean, I will tell you, being Jewish, I, I, I wasn't getting the feeling I was in Germany. It was not like a warm and fuzzy place for me. But when we got to Nuremberg and we wound up driving into this field and there was where Hitler, the, where the Nuremberg rallies were held and there was the building that Hitler stood on and you're standing on stage and you're looking at this building and you realize it's 1983. So just 40 years prior, 1943, Hitler's standing right there uh, addressing the, the, the army right there because they kept the field intact and they kept the building intact except the night or the day we played, um, they sold tickets to uh, – to the local you know, people and GIs from the local NATO base. So those 80,000 drunk people all hanging on that building that you've seen on every newsreel with Hitler walking out with Goebbels and you know Himmler and the whole crew of, of Nazis. And that's all I know is that I've seen that newsreel a million times. So having a historical perspective, being Jewish, standing on stage about 100 feet from that building, staring at that building while, while we're playing, and then having D uh, admonish the audience during It's Only Rock and Roll, But I Like It, to put the right arm up in the air, right? So when he goes, and I like it, and you got 80,000 people going like that with the right arm in the air, and you're standing oh, on stage geez. watching it, I get chills telling that story, okay? You know, I, I, Mendoza, Mark Mendoza's real last name is Glickman. So we're the two Jews in the band. You know, people think D. Snyder's Jewish. He's not. So I walked over to Mark, while this was going on, and I said something like, yo, hey, Jew boy, like, you know, if we can call each other that, I went, do you believe this? And Mark is like, no, I don't believe it. I mean, it was, I have to tell you, I walked off stage and the promoter, Ozzy Hoppy, said to me, JJ, you a Jew? And I go, yeah. He go, I go, how'd you, how'd you figure that? He goes, because you're white as a ghost. And that's what happens when the Jews play here. And I went, what What the hell does that mean? And he goes, last year, Bob Dylan played. You know, he's Jewish. His name is Zimmerman. He had the same reaction. I went, oh, that's really wonderful. Thanks for telling me that. You know, I mean, it was, re- you know, when you do that, when, when you, it, you ask me about special things, you know, like, what did you see? You know, we saw stuff. And by the way, it's not the sex, drugs, rock and roll party stuff or whatever. It didn't exist anyway, but it's not those things. It's the, what I just told you things. It's that kind of stuff, you know, that freaks you out. Well, my favorite Genesis tune of all time is Dancing with the Moonlit Night, because I think that it goes through so many changes from a, ca- a cappella plain song at the beginning through to something that's Elgarian and then something that one could only describe as the fusion, but with a nod to Mozart in places. And um, and uh, I don't think anyone has ever written anything quite like that. And I, I think it's full testament to for Collins drumming that he was able to take everyone's <clears throat> ideas and fuse them all together and make it swing because uh, there are moments where almost every bar changes and there's there's a change of gear. You know, when we signed with Columbia, we took, you know, our, our advance for the Fear album was probably a tenth of what MCA was offering us. And we took a little licensing fee for the first two albums. But we had this attitude. It's like, if we take your money, then we got to do what you say. And, and so we're not going to take your money. We're going to earn what we make if we make anything. And we're going to make the best records we possibly can. And we don't care if we have a hit. I mean, we were listening to, you know, Dinosaur Jr. and Dump Truck and Squirrel Bait and Husker Du and The Replacements 
and we didn't give a fuck. Oh, no. We, the bands we loved were not trying to have hits. And the irony of Toad's career is that when we had a hit, we became a punchline for jokes about how the the majors were destroying indie music, right? <laughs> and we were one of the first bands to kind of cross that threshold when right at that time in the in the early 90s when uh, you know radio was deregulated, when the formats were all over the place, where indie music was starting to cross over and make it big. And, you know, once again, we just had this attitude that uh, at the one hand, I think helped us and saved us. On the other hand, the disease of bands in the nineties was to be on major labels and act like you were on an indie label. So you think of bands like Counting Crows or Pearl Jam who refused to sing their singles live or would disfigure their singles so they were unrecognizable live, right? Uh, you know, thinking of Adam and how, you know, Mr. Jones and me, he would like <laughs> never sing the melody, like, and, and Pearl Jam, like wouldn't sing alive. Right. And like, so we were all on major labels, but we were all acting like we were too cool for school and we didn't want any success. And, and so there was a lot of self-sabotage in that. And I think if a band wasn't also really crystal clear on who they were, what their image was. And like, I think we thought REM didn't have an image uh, because it just felt like, no, this, we roll out of bed, we look this way, we're just cool, call it. And we're like, we can do the same, but we just were schlubs. Uh, <laughs> and, you know, they were art forward as people, I think. And we were nerds. And, and so if you don't, pay attention to those things and think they might be important, then people fill in the gaps for you and they don't ever do it flatteringly. <laughs> what were your first impressions of, of Sweet Home Alabama and Free Bird when you heard them? And, and what changes, if any, did you make to those songs that improved them from when you first heard them? Well, in Sweet Home Alabama, um, when he says, uh, well, I heard Mr. Young sing about her, um, I overdub myself imitating Neil Young singing Southern Man. And I put it in the background so you could barely hear it. Did you ever hear it? Now I'm going to listen for it. And, and oh, okay, well, so you didn't hear it. Now I'm going to definitely, I'm going to have to, as soon as we're done with this, I'm going to have to go back and play it and listen for it specifically. Um, so, so is everybody else. Walk us through the events that led to your casting in Little House on the Prairie. I mean, was it a big casting call? Did you get a call from an agent or producer? How did that first audition come about? Well, that's what's so crazy. It was like a multi-audition process. It was so beautiful. So they realized they're going to finally make the books. There mm -hmm. had been a guy, uh, well, Ed Friendly had gotten rights to them, and he some, couldn't talk anyone into making the show. He was a big producer, and he's like, everyone's like, Little House in the Prairie. But then Michael Landa has just come off Bonanza and is a huge star. Mm -hmm. And Michael says, oh, I want to make Little House in the Prairie. That's the show I want to yeah. do. So they hook up and next thing you know, network says, okay, you got Michael. I guess we're doing Little House in the Prairie. So they have this huge casting call. They see everybody. I actually read for the part of Laura and for the part of Mary. Can you imagine such a thing? Did not work out. Thank heavens. And then they made the pilot. And I was like, oh, oh, I didn't get it. Okay, whatever. And they make the pilot. Then like months later, I get this phone call. My agent says you're to go to Paramount Studios and read Little House on the Prairie. I said, I read for Little House on the Prairie already. They, are, they did that. They made the pilot. No, they're making the series it sold. They, they have all, apparently there's a bunch of other people. It's cast of thousands. And I don't know. I get there and I don't know who Nellie Olson is. I haven't read the books. You don't I even know no what clue. you're reading for. Not a clue. And they didn't tell me, oh, by the way, She's the villain. I had no idea. So I get there and I get the script and I'm sitting there with my dad and I start reading it. And I'm like, I turned to my father. I said, this is not a normal audition. He said, what do you mean? I said, this girl's a total D yeah. she's, she's, the, she's horrible. My father said, what are you talking about? I start reading it for my dad. He starts cracking up laughing. He can't up and goes, oh, she's awful. Um, yeah. I read it for him. He said, okay, you go in there 
and you do it exactly like that. Don't change it. Don't change the thing. You said, in fact, don't rehearse it again. In fact, put those pages down and don't even look at them again. You just go in and just, yeah, do that. Just do whatever the heck you just did. All right. And I went in, I did, and there was Michael Landon and, and Kent McRae and, and, and Ed Friendly, the producers. And they said, go right ahead. And I start reading and they start laughing. They just, start, they lose their minds. And it was really, it was that part about my home. When she reads the essay in school about my homes, the best home and all of all that growth. And they're dying. And they said, would you do it again, please? And I said, yes, yes. Would you like me to change something more this way? And they said, no, just, just read the thing about the house like that. They laughed so hard, so I read it, and that was it. I got out of there, and there were some, there were other girls there, but when I got home, my agent was already, he was on the phone, and he said, no, you got, like, basically, I left the room, and they were like, we're done. We're done. We're done. She, that's it. I was hired on the spot. My agent was on the phone going, no, wardrobe fitting, your gates come out, you, you're done. You're on the show. I, a, a woman named Ethel Winant, who was then the head of casting at CBS, used to come up to ACT. Uh, where I was working and she saw me in a number of plays and so when the role of the Waltons came up I thought I was I had short blonde hair and I was 32 and they were looking for a woman in her 40s with long red hair so um, Fred Silverman apparently I heard him years later did not think I was right for the part and the story goes she wrestled Fred Silverman to the ground over you and thanks to Ethel Winant and I really do believe she fought for me. Um, I got the part because originally there was somebody else cast in the, in the movie, and and I and I think I've heard you mention this before, but it, it, Patricia Neal, I think, wanted the part for Patricia, Olivia, right? Yeah. And then you know, well, I didn't know that, and Patricia and I became very good friends years later because she's the most gracious woman in the world. And I was sitting in um, uh, Joe Allen's in New York, and um, this. This woman that I thought of as a huge movie star, Patricia Neal, came all the way over and said, congratulations, you're just lovely in the role, blah, blah, blah. And I said, well, thank God you didn't want it because it, I got it. And she said, oh, but I did, darling. They didn't want me. And um, I've never forgotten that because she was so gracious. I, I think I would have hit in a corner of some part art that I'd really want and had gone to somebody younger. I don't know. Hopefully I would be gracious too, but we became very close friends, very good friends. She's a lovely, lovely, she was a lovely light. For younger people who've seen E.T. but have missed out on your other work, it's almost like you exploded back onto the scene when you met Mike Flanagan. Um, I know yeah. he's been building his brand for a while, but ever since Hill House came out, it's like, every good horror film or show that comes out he's he he seemingly has had some sort of hand in making you have a unique perspective having worked so closely with him on so many projects talk to us a little bit about the man himself when did you first hear about him so i met mike in 2014 in a general meeting uh but he was talking about this film that he was doing, uh, Ouija Origin of Evil, uh, which is sort of a, a sequel prequel to uh, a Blumhouse movie called Ouija, which I, I hadn't seen. I, I'm, you know, ironically, I'm not much of a horror fan. I don't know much about the horror world, but I met Mike and he said, I'm a big fan of your work. And I want to cast you in this uh, as Father Tom, but I want to I want to cast you in everything that I do. And I'm sitting here thinking, you know, I was about to fade into obscurity. You know, I was just probably a couple of years away from just kind of slipping off the edge of the known world. And here's this guy who wants to, like say I'm his favorite actor and put me in everything. So I didn't believe him, you know? I thought he was just selling me some Hollywood line. But the part came through and I did it and I had a blast working with him. And he was the most organized director I've ever worked with, you know? Like everything is lined down. He's got a shot list that he's built sets around. So, I was kind of 
taken aback by his enthusiasm and his uh, proficiency, I, I suppose. And then he kept good on his word and he kept feeding me these parts. You know, every few months I would get a call and he would say, I got something. Do you want to do it? And I had never experienced that before. So it was kind of fun. And it's been fun working with him because he never gives me a dull, um, a dull job. Uh, Bobby Kimball was uh, um, recruited to uh, and asked or asked to do the the chorus vocals because he was the high singer in the band. But everybody else, including Bobby, Lukather, and uh, both tried to do the verses. And it was so wordy and a little bit complicated for their style of singing that I was the only one that could actually sing my own words that I had written. So I was the low man in the totem pole. So I got to sing it. And uh, it's funny how things turn out. You know, that ended up being our number one record. And uh, uh, again, it wasn't uh, supposed to go on the album. It was an 11th hour uh, song that was written. Uh, we had the whole album done. And I, I had came up with this uh, verse and this chorus on Africa and asked Jeff Ricardo to write a special beat for it, a hypnotic beat that would uh, be indicative of South Africa. And uh, he came up with something really special. And uh, uh, again, that album, uh, everybody kept telling me to save it for my solo record, uh, Africa, which is, a, which is a polite way of telling you it's not going on our record, you know? So uh, I'm very happy that it made it. And uh, it's been a, a, um, a real landmark song uh, iconic song in Toto's live repertoire as well. I was on with Ferguson. Uh, this is what used to make, and to me it's what made, you know, Jack Parr, for whatever you think of Jack Parr, you know, they, it is that when I was a kid, I'm watching him, I'm like, you know, it was just that they would talk. And, uh, you know, you had on people like for a hundred shows. I mean, these some of these people, you have up to a hundred shows. They would come back and be the other guest. They weren't the sidekick, but they'd be the kind of the sidekick, and uh, and they just have conversations, and and so with Craig, that's what we had. And boys, one night we're on, we're on there, we're we're rolling along, and Craig goes. Um, uh, we discover we were living in the East Village at the same time. There was we were what bar, and he was a he was a he was drinking heavily at that time, and I was drinking, and what. And we eventually found out that we spent a lot of time at the same bar and never... And never bumped into each other? Never bumped into each other. But didn't know each other at the time either. But never, never cried. We never talked. We, you know, we were both sitting on our plate wherever we were. And it, that's a great moment. That's a real moment on TV and what makes, what makes for something special. Did Greg ever talk about his brother Dwayne otherwise? I mean, did his life and death have continued significance to him in a way that he would talk about it? Or was it one of those things he kept very private like a lot of us do? He kept a lot of things very private. And, and Greg would choose who he would bring all the way in. And I don't know why this is the case, but people have always felt very comfortable talking to me. I think that's why I feel a lot of comfort as a music educator as well. I really try to listen and I try to take time to understand where someone else is coming from. And when I joined Greg's band, he really started to gravitate towards me on the first tour. I'll never forget. I was, I think we were going to play like our fourth gig, 2000, January, 2009. We were, playing multiple nights at the Rams head in Annapolis and we were in that gym at the Lowe's down the street I was running on the treadmill and he came in and you know at this point I'm like the new guy in the band and I was nervous you know and he comes in and, and he starts talking to me so I stopped on the treadmill and we we sat down I'll never forget on these two treadmills and we talked for an hour and he told me all these stories about Dwayne and how hard it was to lose him and how hard it was to go on with life after losing him and how hard it is to play music and think about him. And it was just this really like beautiful 
moment we had. And it was kind of like so early in my tenure that it didn't occur to me till years later when, you know, he asked me to be the music director and we started writing songs. I started to understand, you know, this this started on that day on the sitting on the treadmills when we should have been working out. And instead, we were talking about how do you go on after losing the most important person in your life besides your mom, you know? When I arrived at this little studio, it's called The Lighthouse. Um, There's just David there. Uh, there were just tapes everywhere and CDs. He was exhausted. And he was doing his first movie that he was a composer of. But he was also simultaneously doing a soundtrack album with 10 original songs, with 10 original artists. It's like lunacy, really. So when I got there, he said to me, look, John, I know I've asked you to write, but will you sing this? And he played me this song and it was like, not great. And I said, I really think we could do better. And he said, I'm exhausted, man, please just sing. I said, just, let's just have an hour. He said, okay. So we went in the control room. There was just like a piano there and there was a drum machine. And uh, we wrote a song, probably 10 minutes. I thought, wow, this is great. He said, we can do better. I thought, okay, so we, off we go. Another 10 minutes. Wow, this is eager as we can do better. Third time in, San Almost Fire. Um, got the great tune, got it all done, probably in a couple of hours. Uh, and I was due to come in and sing it the next day. But I could not get inspired by the text of the movie. I came, I came from the north, north of England. I left school at 15. This was a movie about, you know, Silver Spoon Kids, you know, collegiate thing, completely out of my comfort zone. So David said, look, there's nothing to do with the movie. I'm going to show you this little videotape of a local news station in Vancouver, David's hometown. But there, there was this film of this kid, he said, and this kid came in the studio a couple of weeks ago, and he really inspired me. So he puts the video cassette in. And as this guy comes up on screen, like I am now, you can just see him kind of from the waist up. And he's beautiful looking young guy, looked like a young Kennedy. And I realized very quickly that he's in a wheelchair. And he says, two years ago, I was living the life. And then I had a car crash and uh, broke my back. And he said, I realize you break your arm, you break your leg, you're in a cast for eight weeks. You break this one in your back and you're in a chair for the rest of your life. He said, I'm going to do something about it. I'm going to get in this chair and I'm going to wheel it around the world on the Man in Motion tour. And then the video starts running in the TV station of this like truck, just an old truck with a spare wheelchair on the front. And it says, Rick Hansen, Man in Motion, World Tour. Man, the goosebumps on my neck. So, wow, I'm going to write this story. So I went back to the hotel and I wrote the story of what I imagined, because he was only two months in. This was going to take two years. So I wrote uh, the lyric about what I imagined his journey would be like. Uh, but I knew the film company were going to kick it. So I made it so that when I'm talking about the pair of wheels, they're going to think it's Demi Moore's Jeep. For once in his life, a man has his time. That they think that's when Emilio gets the girl. But it's entirely about a guy wheeling across the desert up a mountainside. And St. Elmo's fire, this freak of nature burning in the sky. And he's wheeling too the embodiment of his dream. That's our show for tonight. Thank you so much for watching and thank you so much for tuning in every single week. Stay tuned during 2023 as we look forward to season four of The Weekly Show with David J. Maloney.